So I've been hearing that a lot this yeah. week, <laughs> and I love that. Yeah. So, uh, they're going to be passing out some of her books. Yeah. And so, loaning you a here. copy of the book so you can refer to it during the talk. can open to page 180, 181. All right. Give, give me my cue. I'm ready to begin. Yeah, with. let's go. All, all right. Let's do it. So, welcome, everyone. My name is Esther Gokhle, and I teach people how to restore their primal posture, which is the posture and body mechanics you used to have when you were two years old and that your hunter-gatherer ancestors had, you don't even have to go that far back. Your great-great-grandparents had, had this kind of structure and pattern of movement as well. And um, you also still find this in non-industrial cultures today, all over the world. So we're gonna talk about a couple of things. I wanna zero, hone in on a couple of aspects of a natural gait. And it's, it's actually a butt talk. It's two things you wanna have in your butt, two characteristics that most people don't have today. And one is that you want your behind out behind you, like that. That's part of why it's called a behind. It really is meant to be out behind you as opposed to what you know, the modern fashion might have you believe. Um, and you also want certain glute muscles active enough that they are organizing your legs in an appropriate way. External rotation for the legs. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few slides just to give you an idea of how this looks. Um, so you can see, for example, these women who I, um, if someone could check the focus on the thing, that would be great. Um, so these are women I observed in Burkina Faso, which is a very traditional culture, non-industrial, non in um, sub-Saharan Africa. And um, here these women are carrying things on their head and walking, and you can see how all of their legs have some degree of external rotation. Okay, and it shows up as the feet turned, turning out to some extent. And this is um, not common in people in our culture. And what's also interesting is that what we're taught to do very often is parallel feet. You see that in a lot of subcultures. And, you know, People here are very familiar with the arguments of, hey, you look at these traditional cultures to get some clues as to what is truly normal. And you can see all of them have their feet out. Um, and here too, you see how the feet and the entire leg turns out. And this is from some Mybridge photographs. So he was, um, he captured very handily um, the form and movement habits of people from about a century ago. And you can see how the buttocks 
are really active and part of what's thrusting this man forward. And it helps him that his behind is behind. It kind of puts all these buttock muscles in a position of mechanical advantage. They can leverage better to propel him forward. And you see this very clearly. And this woman in the Congo, again, her behind is out behind her, allowing her buttock muscles to be truly active and propel her forward. <laughs> very primal scream there. This is a Lenny Riefenstahl picture of the Nuba. And you see very clearly how the legs are externally rotated. It's not just the feet pointing out, it's the entire leg externally rotated. And you need that to be able to nest the pelvis appropriately between the legs. If you have your legs turned in, then the bones of the pelvis jams into the femur and cannot nest appropriately. Very important principle which unfortunately we miss in adult society, and even worse, in kid society. And I will show you um, how, what that looks like in a few slides. So that's what it looks like when your behind is really out behind you. And I'm, I would like to make a distinction about where this curvature is happening, where this angle happens. And what you can see here in these Ubang tribesmen is that the angle is extremely low in the spine. It is the lowest possible place that can move, L5, S1. And then up higher, you can see that he has an even groove in his spine. There isn't any significant curvature in the upper lumbar area, in the small of the back, you could say. And this is what you see also in the ancient Greeks, you can see here that L5, S1, way down, low in the spine, is quite curved. And then up higher, you see that there really isn't much curve. So I want you to understand this distinction of where the curve happens in the lumbar spine, because that's not a distinction that is usually made, not in the medical literature, not in fitness circles, not anywhere, really. And if, if people kind of define curvature as by the way they design furniture, for example, then it's usually put in the wrong place. We'll see that. So I want you to understand this clearly. This is a Cambodian bodhisattva figure, very different culture, similar shape. An angle, less angle. People from East Asia tend to have a little bit less than average L5-S1 curve. People of African extraction have a little more than average L5-S1 curve and then Caucasians are somewhere in the middle, okay? So here, you see that the angle is still down low at L5-S1, and then up higher, there really isn't much curve. So when I say behind out behind, I'm talking about just the behind being out behind. I'm not talking about sticking out your butt and arching your back, wrong place, okay? And this architecture, is also what you find in little kids the world over. So all of us had this. When we were two years old, we had our behinds out behind, and we had them out behind from the right place, L5S1, and not arching our back up higher, and neither tucking our butts, like unfortunately we're being taught to do in modern times. So this picture shows very clearly this distinction. So how would you describe, she has a curve in her back, true? Does it look a little different from the Ubang and the Greek statue and the little kid? How would you say it's different? Higher up. Higher up. So her curve is up at around L1, L2, and down at L5, S1, how much curve does she have? None. So she's actually got two issues. She is swayed and she is tucked, okay? So, and you want to address both those issues and in a very particular order. Like you don't want to first go and try and put in curvature down low and stick your butt out, then you will exaggerate the curve up higher and get into trouble. So it's not the way you don't want to do it. So you first want to elongate and straighten out the upper part of your back where there's inappropriate curvature. You want to harness that place really well and then you start introducing curvature down below. 
order is very important. This is an interesting slide that capitulates why, um, now how we used to have the right idea about where these curvatures should happen. So this comes from an anatomy book published in modern times. And you can see this person is facing this way. This is their behind. There's not that much curve at L5S1. The behind isn't really significantly angled back. The curve is kind of spread all through the lumbar area. And this is the classic S-shaped spine that we're all supposed to, you know, we thought is normal. We're taught is normal to have. Our furniture teaches us that, that those kind of, if you've seen any ergonomic furniture, it's all about S-shaped curve. It's about supporting what is thought to be a normal spinal shape. This picture comes from a anatomy book published in 1911. And it's quite different. Lots of angle at L5S1. Reminds of all those pictures we just saw. L5S1, big angle, accommodates the naturally wedge-shaped L5S1 disc. In our species, this disc is wedge-shaped. Distinguishes us from four-legged creatures. And so now that it is wedge-shaped, it would like a wedge-shaped house to live in, yeah? And these discs that are all cylindrical sh would like a cylindrical house to live in. And they're, everything is fine, and they're not getting worn and torn here. They get worn and torn at all levels. And the edges of the vertebrae are inappropriately stressed, which causes osteophytes, all kinds of problems that happen from this. So anyway, the point of this is that we used to have the right idea about spinal curvature, but we've somehow forgotten. In the last century, something else came uh, in place of this understanding, and it is now this S-shaped curve that everybody is being shepherded towards, whether by the design of furniture or by the um, instructions of your fitness coach or um, by the medical literature and you know metal that's being inserted into your uh, your you know your friend's kid's scoliotic spine. So, um, very little in the medical literature makes a distinction between upper and lower lumbar curve. So this is a study that actually makes that distinction. Very unusual. Mostly it's all about more curve, less curve. Where the curve happens is not talked about. And so you completely lose this effect of upper versus lower, right? You have more upper, less lower, looks the same as the other way around in those studies. In this study, the finding is that if you have this kind of S-shaped spine, that correlates with back pain. And if you have the more ancestral, primal, J-shaped spine, less curve up top, more curve down below, that correlates with being pain free. So that is interesting. This is actually recorded in the medical literature. And you know, there are other things about these cultures that are, are attractive, like that they don't have disc disease. The Peel tribals of central India, again, not as much study has been done about these populations as we would like. But here you see that 50-year-old beals have discs that are indistinguishable, this is disc narrowing, from the 20-year-olds. Pristine discs at age 50, unheard of in our culture. In our culture, we expect with age that the discs are gonna get worn and torn. And, he, and they do. Now, this, these two graphs are interesting to compare because we in our culture always blame everything on sitting, right? Sitting is so bad. You have to do something to earn your living, right? And if you do manual labor, if you look at this graph, you're actually worse off in terms of your dis, dis, you know, degeneration and so on. So the truth of the matter is, in modern culture, we do badly no matter what we are busy doing. But sitting actually pr protects you from the worst of it. You know, like manual laborers do even worse than sedentary. So it's not really fair, I think, to blame sitting. Um, and just, again, not as much in the medical literature as we would like, but there is evidence that 
people in these non-industrial cultures have less back pain. Um, and you can see some, and in my, the bibliography of my book, um, you find several references to these cultures and their lower incidence of various musculoskeletal problems. So, you know, there are many reasons why you want to have this in your body. So I'm going to switch to, you know, why we have these distortions. And I'm going to just, actually, this is a good time to take a couple of volunteers. We've had some very brave souls agree to come up on, you know, anyone who can stand to improve their gait. Um, please, I had some volunteers. Yes, we have a little conga line here, so please come up, anyone who's willing. And let's make a line facing that way. I'm gonna try and stay out of the, yeah, like that. And one behind the other, like a conga line, and you're gonna be feeling monitoring the glutes. I think we have enough people, thank you. All right, great, we'll make a little circle. And the rest of you can do it on your own. If you want to follow along in the center aisle, that, that's great. So you're holding the glutes of the person in front of you. Like, yes, so go like that, okay? And we are going to take steps. Let's do this in, in wow, you guys are already in. So, Last, right, left, right, left, slow it down. And you are monitoring the glutes of the person in front of you. See if there's something happening there. Is there a squeeze, 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 or is it a little asleep? We are trying to figure that out. And how much? So flat hand. All right, so we stop. How many people felt? a lot of really strong muscular contraction under your hands of the person in front. Hands up. <laughs> High up. No, no, like this doesn't count. Really strong, really good glute squeeze. All right, so we've got some people who are already in good shape. So what we're gonna do is learn a few things and see if we can improve that action. And then we'll see if we can get everybody's arms raised the next time we do the conga line. How's that? All right? So how do we get the, this to happen? How do we get the, um, the behind to be behind and the legs to be externally rotated, which then facilitates a really good, strong glute action? If you're not used to it, you also have to add, you might have to do it deliberately until it becomes habit. The two reinforce each other. When your behind's behind, the butt can really work. When the butt works, it pulls your behind behind. Okay, so it goes both ways. And, you know, there's also a habit thing because no matter how good it is, there is po a possibility of not doing anything. All right, so, and feel free to join and maybe we can spread out in a way that people can see what we're doing. And anyone who cares to join the practicum in the aisle, please feel free. What we're gonna do is externally rotate the legs, okay? So we're starting with the feet, maybe turned out a little, and then you want to really weight the front of your foot. So you're really weighting the front of the foot, and then you are kind of, and this is a tricky move, you are swiveling in the heel like that, okay? So you fix the front of the foot, and then you swivel in the heel. Yeah, so it's not about turning your foot out so much as changing the shape of your foot. Tricky move, see if you can do it. It helps if you turn the knee out. If you turn the knee out, it kind of helps the heels come in. So both these actions, you see what I'm doing? So knee out, heel in, great. And you're kind of, so that helps to externally rotate the legs. Good. So now that your leg bones, your femurs, are out of the way of the pelvis settling, you can do a little toilet squat, okay? <laughs> so very small toilet squat. Or if you want a more elegant image, think about playing tennis. 
except you don't want your weight on the front of the foot. You want your weight to stay on your heels. So you're doing this little toilet squat, and then you allow gravity to kind of settle your pelvis between your legs. That's now pos more possible because your legs are out of the way. They're not in the way jamming the pelvis where it might nest. Legs are externally rotated and you can settle your pelvis. Okay? If you need some help, use your hands here and kind of uh, let the weight of the arms additionally help your pelvis settle. Now, mind you, this is not forcing your bottom back, okay? We're not trying to arch our back and strain our back and so on. We're just letting gravity do the job. And then once you've gotten your pelvis kind of nested, and it does take some practice to really let these muscles that have been perhaps habitually tight, let them go, okay? So especially those of you who have done like three zillion crunches and <laughs> overdeveloped your rectus abdominis and have the look of the muscle man and so on, you guys are gonna have an extra hard time letting those muscles go and truly letting the pelvis nest between the legs. So you like that and once that's nested, then you gently straighten out your legs, but you don't lock them and you straighten out your groin, you don't lock that either and you come to a standing position, which may feel a little odd because you're not used to it, but is actually closer to natural, primal, than what most people in our culture are doing. And now you have to make sure that you're not arching your back. And that you manage with your rib cage, not by retucking the pelvis. That's unfortunately what we're taught in our culture, right? If you have a sway in your back, what are we taught to do? Tuck the? pelvis. No, don't tuck the pelvis. We just went through all this trouble to settle the pelvis well. Now we don't want to undo all of that. What you want to tuck is the ribs, the rib cage. Okay, don't tuck the pelvis, tuck the rib cage. And that's tricky. To do that in isolation is tricky. And here's one way you can do it. You place your fists on the bottom of your rib cage and then you gently push back and that'll train you to isolate these, the correct muscles instead of rectus abdominis, okay? So you're gently pushing back. You actually want this to be flush. Remember those um, Greek statues? The front, all flush. You can't tell where the ribcage ends. You don't wanna be sticking out your ribcage like that, standing up straight. Bad way to have good posture. <laughs> All right, that's not good posture. So don't stand up straight. Actually, you wanna do the opposite, even if it feels odd, okay? So you're tucking the ribs, not the pelvis. And now, if you have any hunch up top, it's gonna to kind of show up the full degree of hunch, right? Sometimes the reason we sway is because we're hunched up top and we're trying to compensate for that this way. Not good, okay? So now we've undone that compensation. We no longer wanna stand up straight, we want to stand up smart, and we are now going to address the hunching to whatever degree you have it in its own right, okay? And that we're going to do with a little shoulder roll, a little forward, a little up, a little back. Now be careful, don't let your rib cage come popping up, right? These muscles might be tight and then boop, next thing you know your ribs are popping up, you don't want that. So keep them still, and it's just the shoulder going back. And uh, you know you might not want to stay that bent because if you if you really crouch it's going to be exhausting, you know, and it's going to look a bit funny, you know. Imagine yourself in your next cocktail party. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to be just short of locking, not locked, but not bent, super bent either. All right. So we've got the rib cage anchored, I like to call it, and the shoulders roll back, and there's improvements on the neck that could happen too. There's so much to do, only 40 minutes. And so we keep this anchored and now we've got a little more like um, a, a responsive structure. Like if something happens, you can move. You're not just parked there kind of, you know, unavailable to whatever happens. You actually have a bit of a ready position. It's not as ready as you know, volleyball or tennis, but it's ready for the sport of life, all right? So here you are, and you are rolled out, with your shoulders and your neck is tall, and now you're behind, if we've 
managed to do all these many steps somewhat accurately, your behind is ready to work. And now when you take a step, you can get this muscle working. So go ahead and take a step, one step, and see if you can find that muscle <coughs> squeeze. You want to leave the weight on the back leg, actually. And you squeeze, and if you're not finding it that easily, then turn your back foot facing out while you are still facing forward. And now squeeze, okay? It's easier to find that muscle. If you're having a hard time, raise. Imagine you're a ballet dancer and you're doing an arabesque and you raise your leg with your foot facing out and now you've got it. That's gluteus medius, right? And now you place it back, but keep it engaged. And now go do the other side. See if you can find the other side. And you squeeze, you want your back leg down on the ground, that's it. And you squeeze that muscle. And if you're having a hard time finding it, you externally rotate your leg a little extra. It helps you find it. You can raise the leg, that definitely helps you find it. And now, walk. And see if you can find that squeeze with every step you take. And if you'd like me to check on you, just walk by me and I'll take that as an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm consciously squeezing it. Squeeze. Yeah, conscious is fine for the beginning because, you know, it, it takes a little bit to wake that muscle up sometimes. Yeah. If it's been fast asleep, it's, um, yeah, there we go. It's nice. And squeeze. And if you set your feet facing a little bit more out, you will find that muscle more easily. In the beginning, I even have people walk a bit like Charlie Chaplin, just so they can find that muscle. But once you find it, you don't need to be that exaggerated. Just a little bit out is normal. Sure. Squeeze. Good. Good. That's the right muscle, and that's a good beginning. Ah, so you actually don't want to lock your knees, but that's a little complicated to learn. There's magic in, not in using your glutes but not locking your knees lies in foot action. And I don't want to inundate you with information today, but just keep that in mind. And in the meantime, just take small steps so you don't hurt your knees, okay? Squeeze, 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 good. <laughs> See, and those of you who can tell that you haven't been using this muscle for a few years or decades, you know, you will find that, hey, this gives you more propulsion, it gives you a whole lot of things that are actually really valuable for different aspects of your musculoskeletal health. There we go, squeeze, squeeze, excellent. So it's happening a little bit late. You actually want the step and the squeeze to be happening together, rather than you take the step and then add the squeeze as an afterthought. Are you stepping heel to toe? There we go, better. Are you stepping heel to toe? And and you know, you together. practice for a while and it becomes, there's an inherent logic to this. And you will uncover that in your body. So in the beginning, it's good enough. That's a really nice, strong squeeze. Good job. Good. And you know, right now you're doing a little bit of ice skating, which is fine. Like, you know, going like that, that's one way to actually find the muscle. And then over time, you will find that muscle and another muscle which will keep you kind of going straight rather than weaving. In the beginning, we'll just discover, you know, any way you can just get that muscle to wake up is good. Squeeze, good. Squeeze, little more, little more. Yeah, avoid falling forward. You don't want your weight to kind of fall forward. If you keep yourself from falling forward is another way to get that muscle to. Don't worry about too many things at once. I mean, I can tell you a hundred things that you might be doing, but if you think about all of them, then it's all in your head. That's good. And in the beginning, you want it, you definitely want your body to learn this, not just have it be an intellectual exercise. Squeeze, good. So you can take care of some of that arching by anchoring your rib cage like that. And that's gonna feel a bit odd, but you ask your friends and they'll tell you it doesn't look odd. You're just used to arching back, so straight up and down feels odd. Cool? All right, keep going and we'll move on and I'm happy to help anybody. I am also doing a few of the, the break classes. If anyone wants to show up, I'm glad to help you. Additionally, um, I do want to move on a little bit and show you 
you know, where this, these have, like, why did these muscles fall asleep? You know, why did they um, stop working if it's so natural for us to squeeze these muscles when we walk? And this is one answer. This is how, in modern times, we start out, okay? If, our, if, we're, if we're transported around, we're put in car seats, and the car seats are almost always, in the last 20 plus years, shaped like this, and we are being taught, this is the age at which our brains are learning what it means to sit, and we're being taught this, okay? Really bad news. I mean, we could not design a worse, a more effective system to destroy the next generation. It's this and the horrible food that we feed our kids. It's like to me, top of the list. Then, un, you know, unbeknownst to ourselves, we reinforce all of those tucking habits and internally rotating habits in the way we carry our kids. That is my most wonderful husband, fantastic parent totally ignorant of how you carry a kid. This is our first baby. You know, in Russian, they have a saying that your first baby, your first kid is like your first pancake. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes, but you know what? That, it's a fantastic pancake. Anyway, it's, okay. it's that's it. And, and it has its charm and so on. So she's now just halfway through medical school and trained in teaching this method, among other things. And, um, is doing just fine. It's never too late to undo all these bad habits. We work with 100-year-olds. Don't ever despair. But it helps to not be taught these wrong things. This comes from a, a book called The Posture Prescription. It's written by an orthopedic surgeon. And um, it's unusual that a surgeon would pay any attention to posture. So he has to, you know, it's commendable. But then look what he's teaching. Exactly the opposite of what I teach. He wants everybody to tuck their pelvis. This is what he's calling good posture. <laughs> Exemplified by a flat back. So he wants no L5-S1 curve, okay? Bent knees, not so practical and pretty fatiguing. Tightly pulled in abdomen. Well, that destroys a lot of things. And you know, for all the attention that we in this community pay to how we eat, and the flora and fauna in our digestive tract, we unfortunately are not paying enough attention to the architecture of this cavity. Because no matter how well you eat, if then what you do is reduce the cavity by a third, it's not gonna work very well. You know? It's not designed for this. And not only have you, dis you know, reduced the volume by a third, but you have messed up the blood circulation getting to those organs, the nerves, the innovation, you know, that, that comes from a distorted spine, and all kinds of mischief. And you've also, so I, in my experience, I find that this posture correlates with irritable bowel syndrome, chronic constipation, um, men, infertility, menstrual cramping, because you just squished all your organs and done all kinds of numbers on them. And you don't have the pubic bone for support of all your organs, okay? Pubic bone, no matter what your age is, is gonna hold everything up just fine. If what you do with your pubic support is stick it out front, then it can't provide any support at all, and all you've got is your little, very flimsy Kegel muscle, pubococcygeal muscle, very weak, trying to hold everything up. That doesn't work well. And this is an invitation for your insides to fall out of you, which they will. And it can be rectal prolapse and hemorrhoids. That's all the guys have to worry about. Women have more to lose. Uterine prolapse, bladder prolapse, urinary incontinence, so common that we call it normal. And that's one of our approaches in modern society when we have problems. You know, you solve them by just calling it normal, right? So everybody's leaking every time, you know, these older women, they laugh, they leak, normal. It's too bad. So this is an invitation to raise the bar, you know. Consider that we are actually much better designed than we think in modern times. And that maybe this is not the way to be, you know, carrying your organs around. And instead, 
you know, experiment in this gentle way. Don't stick your bottom out, don't suddenly make huge changes, but provide the organs the support they need with bony structures under there. Um, how, okay, I, this was a long tangent for how we arrive at such poor habits, and so I would like to show, I was promised a baby in this talk, but I see our babies aren't here. So I am going to just show a slide. This, this was one of the best things I learned in child rearing, is how to carry my number two and number three babies on my back, African style. It is awesome. And in addition to being very handy, if there is a baby anywhere out there and can be invited, that would be awesome. So what this does, in addition to providing proximity and a hundred untold advantages, you're cueing the breathing, you are, um, you know, it's safe, the baby can tune in and tune out, uh, in and out as it pleases, um, and all kinds of goodies, but you're also forming the hip joints of the baby. You know, my, my suspicion is that all babies are born with immature hip joints, and that the extreme cases need splints, you know, or are given splints. But short of that, I think there's an awful lot of, you know, external rotation that's missing in the way we treat our babies. And so this, they're on the back, they're open with their legs. This is me with my number two baby. I was taught how to do this. You begin to do it after the umbilical cord has fallen off. Two, first two weeks of life, and then if you have wide hips like I do, then they arrange themselves tadpole-like, like this. And pretty soon, they can come around your waist, and they are getting this external hip rotation, and it is much better than a splint, you know? And you're giving them a chance to form their hips in this natural fashion, and you're getting all these other um, benefits, like lengthening the baby's back, and. And it's ter terrific cueing for the mom. This is one of the things I dream I will be able to pass on in you know, more numbers. Whenever I get to teach a mom this, it's just such a joy because that mom now has, will be able to do all her stuff you know, without, with two free hands, will not have the back problems that I had trying to carry my first kid in the most unnatural of ways. Um, and have all kinds of, you know, liberty and joy of motherhood, really. You know, it's very easy and, and uh, actually uh, reinforcing of a mom's posture. So this is something that I really like to teach. Does something for the hip joints. This, once they're older, and when it's, then this is what, how you want to carry a kid. You do not want to carry a kid like this. Okay, so all the kids in your lives, try to influence them. The best way is to learn it in your own body, then you know how to pass it on, whether it's to your nephew or your friend's kid or your own grandkid or what have you. Other ways to learn. So furniture is really helpful. So this is the way not to design furniture. Every one of you is experiencing the effects of this. Notice that the seat has a hollow this way, right? So what does that do to the legs? Turns them, Turns them in. Really bad, you know? So if you have, if you're sitting with one of these chairs, which you all are, try to fill out this thing, you know, whether it's with your jacket or something, you know, you want to kind of try to help your legs be externally rotated. Stick something under there if you have, if you don't have anything, sit on the tippy front. It still kind of tries to push your leg in, but you can fight it better, yeah? So that you're getting an external rotation and you will immediately, and also if you sit on the very front, you're also getting your behind behind you. So that allows your back to stack well and so on, okay? Um, the back rest is also poorly designed. You can see how it, concave, it's expecting you to be this way, which most of us unfortunately are, but you don't want the chair, the furniture to perpetuate that for you. So fill in that. If you have something, so I designed something to help um, actually 
stretch your back as you sit, which is a very good thing. You can do it at home with the towel or whatever you have. If you have a fabric chair, you can stick that behind you and you can actually get some traction out of it as well as change that unfortunate contour. You know, in your car seat, it's like sticking your head forward really bad. So all the more reason when I go to a rental car, I have a rental car right now, so the first thing I do, I put my cushion there, and if it's a really bad chair, I put my jacket or something behind it, because I need to come further away from the headrest, which is forcing my head forward, not something I'm trying to cultivate. So now, I've got these sticky nubs here, but it could be a towel or something, you know, that'll hold you as well. And I've got extra volume here, and now, this makes any chair into a good chair, decent chair. So I lengthen, hook, roll open the shoulders, I'm good. I'm very comfortable now. And my back is getting this therapeutic stretch, I'm getting rid of that upper lumbar sway. So if you want to open your book to page 59, I'll, uh, I'm going to describe another way. You can do this evening, so if you have been you know, in chairs that go this and way and that way, then you want to lengthen, you want to undo all of that shortening. And just, I'm teaching in Atlanta, so I brought along my chair, and you can see how I put nubs into the back so that you don't have to remember anything. You can hook up to that, and then I made the front curved forward and what they call mushroom cap so that it's gently externally rotating. I really don't like mesh chairs because again, what do they do to your legs? Internally rotate and sink your bottom so you're kind of tucking. And instead you want your legs to go externally and you want your pelvis to settle forward. So you want from any chair, and you can arrange this in a chair, you can put a wedge under your bottom and make that slope, you want to do that. So make your furniture work for you, rather than just be trapped in it, teaching you unfortunate things. Put a wedge, put something, sit on the edge, and have it tip you forward, as well as externally rotate you. Clear? If anyone wants to come, I'm glad to help you. So what I do here is, I like to go up higher when I'm stack sitting, I call this stack sitting, and then down low when I'm stretch sitting. My bottom back, lengthen, attach, and here I am, very comfortable. So I go back and forth, so I have movement, and I like movement this way too. And, but I think that if you have really good positions, then you don't have to constantly be moving around. You know, there's this saying, the best position is the next position. And that is such an admission of defeat, that like, there isn't any healthy position. That I don't buy. Oh, we have a baby. I am going to show you how to carry a baby. So stack, use your furniture to stack sit you on it. Thank you so much. You're welcome to have I am, hello sweetheart. Hello. Say hello. Wow. Super baby. No kidding. Look at that. You gonna go on my back? So notice how I'm carrying her, I'm lengthening her back. Yeah. I'm letting her yeah. him, him. <laughs> I'm letting his legs externally rotate, bottom stick back. I am not doing this, right? Tucking. I'm above that and lengthening, externally rotating. If I want to carry him on my back, where is my claw that I had? Oh. I had there it is. Okay. Are you a surprise? This, this boy is a sport so far, really. He doesn't know me at all. Someone did. So, ready? <laughs> so this is tricky. Externally, he's a little worried. He's hanging in there. <laughs> So this, you can see, takes some skill. I have two kids' worth of experience here doing this. And then you fold in a certain way, 
and you make this somewhat tight, and I don't recommend that you start with this. You really want to first, <laughs> first experiment with hip hinging, and before you do hip hinging, you notice my back is very straight. And to practice that, before you do that, you really want to shape and lengthen your spine first. What's his name? Max. Max. Oh, my speaker fell. If someone can just hold that for me, that would be great. You can just hold it. And so here I am, and I'm here. And this guy is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and there are no knots in this, by the way. And you can see how at the end of it, it's going to be really tidy and very, very cool. You want to be, I, I, and I know some of you are filming and stuff, and you know, be careful. If you are trying to experiment with this at home, get an expert to show you. I got my African friend to show me how, because for example, you don't want to cut off the blood circulation here. You know, so there, there are little nuances to it that you know, we really want to get. And that's true of everything that I'm showing you. Really, it's better to get hands-on guidance. But you can see how liberating this is. And you can see this guy. This guy is extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. And you can imagine, I mean, he's already liking it. But you know, I am free. I, I, I learned how to cross-country ski with my second baby in the back. And that was after you know, my first kid, when I was pregnant nine months, that's when I got into trouble with my back. I came at this the hard way. I had an L5-S1 disc herniation, all those tucking things I was taught, bad bending. And then, are you ready to go back to your parents? <laughs> <laughs> or you want to be jostling around? You want to? And um, so I can feel from his legs that he's used to being internally rotated a little, little bit, so holding. You know, so you want to cultivate that external rotation. But this is pretty amazing, whatever you did with him. <laughs> and see, this is the way it would be in, in a village, right? People would be carrying each other's babies, and the baby would be totally... Oh, that was a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> that was <laughs> so, you know, if you want to learn these things, there are many ways to learn these things. And one way is to learn from the pros. So here I am in Burkina Faso <laughs> trying to copy them. And I can see my left leg isn't straightening out quite as much as my right leg. I could use some help there. Look at their legs. And look at the behinds behind them, the feet out. Can you see that? Behinds very much behind, so the backs are really working. My guide wasn't as good a videographer as he was a translator. What can I say? So that's one way you could learn. A more practical way for most people is to actually take lessons. And I strongly recommend hands-on. Find a teacher, and I've made it. It's very hard work, but we are finally getting our teachers all around the globe so that people have access. You know, we sometimes teach intensive weekends in different places so that people can travel for just a weekend, visit their cousin in New York City, and you know, take a course at the same time. The effects are really impressive. Um, that's a before picture of my husband. You can see at age 27, used to be, how would you describe? <laughs> Head forward, chest is vertical, and they didn't breathe so well, and had a lot of neck and shoulder tension, which guess who, we used to have to massage him every day. Or, <laughs> this is 20 years later, where you'd expect him to be more hunched, which is the way it went in his family, his father and so on, but here you can see he's really quite radically different lots more room between the head and shoulders. Shape of the chest different, that's interesting. You can actually change the shape of your bone by changing the stresses on your bone. Like, you know, if you're like this and never breathing here and only breathing in your belly, nothing's gonna change here in shape. But if you've got your shoulders open and you're actually breathing in a healthy way, which is not neck breathing, but, you know, different kind, breathing actually here, then you can actually change the size and shape of your ribcage, which you can see happened on him. See that? 
see the angle of the sternum, compare that with the one there, right there. You see that? Quite different. Different appearance, different experience of life. I can, I can wax lyrical, but we'll move on. Here is a, a student of mine that I just finished working with, um, or we paused working with him. That's a before, that was about four months ago, and this is about two months ago, okay? So he did six lessons. He did them privately. Usually we teach people in groups, small groups of eight, so that each person gets tons of hands on. Um, that's an, an important. And you can see that's quite a difference, right? Before and after. And we have tons of people, I mean, dramatic stuff, you know, people who are supposed to have spinal fusion and, um, you know, um, have all kinds of interventions. Um, and you can actually make some pretty dramatic changes in a relatively short time if you use the right approaches. You know? If you're teaching something that's actually natural, the body has some memory of it and it can find it again. There's an internal logic to these things. We're not teaching random stuff. That would take forever. Um, uh, let's see, I wanted to share I, for kids one other thing that I've done. I actually decided that kids need to be better served and I'm working with the company on doing something better for those car seats because this is ridiculous and you can't fill with them. You can't put stuffing, then you're compromising security and stuff. So it needs to be designed differently. But for when they're a little older, I shrunk my chair. And the other problem for kids is that they're at adult tables, you know, and you can try to not sit, but basically, you know, we are a sitting culture to a large extent. I mean, look at what we're doing here. I mean, we couldn't very easily have treadmills and desks and whatever else, you know, people have in mind for us right now. And I think sitting in moderation and with breaks is perfectly natural and helpful. But for kids who are stuck at the adult dining table and their legs are dangling and stuff, this is not so healthy. So what I created, you can see here, it's just a little, she's describing how it's comfortable if she sits back and it slopes just right and now she, she is very, so you see how her feet are on the ring and that ring is adjustable so as they grow, you can actually uh, lower it so that the distance between their um, seat and the feet are are appropriate but they also get to be an appropriate height at the dinner table or whatever so I think I mean I really don't like having tons of material stuff in the world but there are a few things that really need to have good design you know if you're gonna sit we might as well sit on something good so I have taken that project on um, with one child's chair and one, one adult chair. But mostly, the most important thing really is, um, is to learn, to learn in your body so that you can adapt to whatever um, situation is offered you. Because it's not always gonna be perfect. But if you really know the basics of, of healthy posture and healthy movement, you can manage almost any situation, and the few that you can't manage aren't gonna kill you, yeah? But unfortunately, right now, um, it, we have a long way to go, and um, I'd like to, you know, right now I'm training teachers. For people who are interested in doing something like this and have wellness and fitness and medical background, might be interested in something, let me know. And I also have a sign-up sheet. We do um, online free workshops every month, and we do a standard free workshop like a couple of times a month. We have free workshops all over the world. Um, and if you sign up, we'll send you our monthly newsletter, no crap, promise. And, um, and then, um, you know, you can continue your understanding and deepen and you know it takes time this is not a heroic effort it's one second here two seconds there of attention against a backdrop of knowledge and basic training and with that I'll end and thank you very much thank you so much Esther and I wanted to let you all know she will be doing a 10-minute break 
at 4.05. Let's get listed on the splash schedule in the front. So I encourage you to come back or talk to her during the breaks or anything. She will really help you. Um, so we'll, we'll have time for like one or two questions. Are we supposed to return these books? Is that yes, what um, I, yes, those were loans. And I meant to show you 50, page 59. That's what I'd like you to do tonight is to hoist yourself up on your elbows, dig in your elbows, and then lay one vertebrae down at a time with extra distance. So you're putting some traction into your spine. That's your homework, okay? And um, if anybody wants to buy the book, they're available for a discounted rate of 20 bucks, and I'm happy to sign, and I can do it at the signing. I, is that the appropriate place? Or if you want to do it here, it's fine by me, you know, in the back, outside, outside hallway outside and otherwise if you could just return them to the boxes that would be fabulous boxes in the back boxes out right by the door yes please ask no one in Atlanta I'm, I'm teaching but my courses are already full and I'm coming back in November for the Western Price Conference and I think I have a few more spaces in that conference so if you're an Atlanta person sign up soon there are only a few more places. But we have teachers. If you're interested, just request a class in your town. We send teachers when there's enough demand okay. in any place. We're going to actually move the rest of the questions out to the hallway so that we can move on to the next talk. Just to